Well, it is good to be here with you all. I am really excited to get to continue this series, The X Factor, talking about what is that, that extra something? What is that, that thing that Jesus had that transforms our lives, that he, that he brought to the table for us? And we're going to have a lot of fun here today. Before we start, I want to pray, and I want to thank um, our Heavenly Father just in this Palm Sunday for what he's done and what he's going to do. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Just as there were those that declared Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, and worshiped you, Lord, we worship you this morning. We declare your kingdom come, your will be done in our lives. Open up our hearts to receive whatever it is that you're doing, desiring to do in us this morning. We love you so much, Jesus, in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, over the past few years, I've realized that the tastes of my wife and I in films have changed drastically. You know, Kenny, we used to watch a whole lot of fun films. We used to go to the theater. We used to watch a lot of, you know, the Marvel films. I can't remember the last time I watched a Marvel film, Kenny. What we find, well, Star, that's different. That's different, Ben. We make sacrifices. If it says Lord of the Rings or Star Wars, we sacrifice. However... Everything else out there, we, uh, you know, we, we've, we've, haven't, we've found we haven't had very much time, but my wife and I have been watching a whole lot of children's movies for our three-year-old and our one-year-old, and there is, praise Jesus, a whole lot of gospel truth to be found in these films. I mean, just the other day, I come home, I believe it was Wednesday, I come in, the door was, was bolted, and I'm kind of knocking at the door, my wife runs up, opens the door, gives me a kiss, and then runs back to the couch. And I'm like, what's going on? So I, I come in here. I'm like, what's going on? She's like, I had to watch the end of The Good Dinosaur. I had to see what's going to happen. It was, it was just right here at the end. I mean, but I can't make too much fun of her. We, uh, she often finds me in, in any given morning on the couch, and we'll start off, and the girls will want to watch Daniel Tiger. Any of you parents out there, you know what Daniel Tiger is. And we'll be sitting there watching it, and all of a sudden, Kaylin comes into the room, and she goes, Jonathan, you know that the girls are gone, right? (laughs) And I'm like, well, this was a very important learning lesson about how to share. (laughs) And there's a song that went with it. And I can't cut off that before it's done, just because they left. I mean, i got to learn something from this, too. So we've been watching these, and one of the films that we've come across that more accurately pertains to what we're going to be talking about today is the movie Wreck-It Ralph. Who here has seen Wreck-It Ralph? All right, a number of you, a number of you. Well, for those of you that have not seen the film, we have it up there in the PowerPoint. We see this gentleman Ralph, and he is a character in an arcade game. The name of the arcade game is Fix-It Felix. And what happens is, is that Ralph's role is to try to break down the building. It's actually what he's programmed to do is to break things. Fix-It Felix is his friend, one of his only friends, and he, his job is to fix it, and so people can come and play, but then after hours, What we find is that when everybody's gone from the arcade and all the characters in the video game are sitting there hanging out, talking afterward, Ralph can't but help but continue to break things. It doesn't matter what he is. He walks into a room, breaks the floor, breaks the ceiling, breaks the, the table, breaks the chair, breaks the vase, breaks everything that he comes into contact with becomes broken. And what Ralph craves more than anything else is two things. He wants to stop breaking things, and he desperately wants a relationship with others. Because as he's breaking things, he finds that all of those that are around him, it's difficult to maintain fellowship and relationship with them. He's constantly hurting other people. And as I was sitting there thinking about this story one morning with my cup of coffee, I thought, man, how how accurate is that of humanity? How true is that of our lives? When I'm out on the college campus 
and talking even to my neighbors. There's many that will say, you know what, I'm, not, I'm, a, I'm a decently good person. Maybe they might even say, I don't really believe in God. But one thing they all acknowledge pretty much is that this world is pretty broken. And they also sometimes, in moments, acknowledge how broken they are. This is the reality of humanity. We break everything in life, in marriage, in our soul. There's a reason, isn't there, why we buy Apple products and get warranties. Because we... It's only a matter of time before me or one of my children breaks it. So today we're talking about the fixer. And we're going to explain that a little bit more in coming moments here. But what I want to leave you and start with is the big idea. The big idea for today is that all people and all Christians continually need God to fix their life. We constantly break things that God is fixing. Do I need to switch over? Okay. We constantly break things that God is fixing. How did this come to be? I mean, we see this world that we're in, but were we created this way? Even in following the analogy with Ralph, he decides to leave his video game searching for another reality where hopefully he's not known for just breaking things. Don't we all desire that? As we're either Christians or not Christians here in this room, breaking things consistently around us, hurting our friends or our spouses or even our own soul in a multitude of ways. Don't we desire this? to have this be fixed? And how do we find it? But first of all, where did it come from? Where did this all start? Well, it starts way, way back. A very cursory overview is it starts in the book of Genesis. And what we have is a picture of humanity being created perfect. God comes, creates us perfect, fashions us wonderfully, puts us in a beautiful garden, he says, it is good. It is very good. And then humanity is tempted because there's only one rule. There's two, actually. One is go eat of everything. The other is don't eat of one tree. And humanity is tempted by Satan to break that rule and with it break a whole lot of other things. And this is what we see take place. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, And also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, and also gave some to her husband, who was suspiciously there with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together, made coverings. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden, and the Lord God called to the man, where are you? their usual walk that they did together. All of a sudden, God comes down. He knows what's happened, but he says, where are you, humanity? And they're hiding in shame. A few things happen in this moment that seemingly, I mean, we read these words on the page and it's so innocuous. It's so, it doesn't seem as bad as it is, right? Like, wow, okay, we ate some fruit. What, is, what, what, is, what does that represent? What, is this, what does this represent to us? It's not about some special magical fruit. What it represents is before God had said, will you trust me? Will you allow me to be God? Or will you choose to be God and, in essence, and choose death? Choose God? Choose me? Choose death, life apart from me. And humanity chose to be God, chose self, chose death. That's what we chose. In seconds, everything changed. Closeness to separation. Trust to fear. Perfect to imperfect. Garden to disaster zone. The Hebrew word used by the 
writer here and the imagery that's given is that in that moment, a contagion broke out on earth. That everything was infected by it that humanity touched. That the very fabric of our world shifted. That everything was affected in that moment. moment. Humanity's sin polluted everything and every one that it touched. All of it was contaminated. So if you're God in this moment, we, have, we see this scenario. If you're God in this moment, you've made a perfect creation, now it's contaminated and broken. What do you do? Well, you need to have a plan, which God does and did. But then he brought about a temporary fix. And that temporary fix was animal sacrifice. We see God, even in that moment in the garden, go and sacrifice an innocent animal to make clothing for naked humanity. The animal didn't deserve to die. It was innocent. Adam and Eve had committed a sin. And yet God, most likely right there in front of them, showed them visually the cost of their sin in just a small fractional way. Yeah. Killed the animal. They, they witnessed its innocence. And then he made clothing for them that they were to wear. Here we see the beginning of animal sacrifice to help to cover over the sin, to help to assuage the guilt a little bit. But it wasn't an ultimate fix. It was temporary. We see this even with the Old Testament authors in Leviticus and Numbers. It actually, when we're talking about this contamination taking place everywhere, when the high priest would go into the, into the inner room, he would actually, yes, put the blood of the innocent animal on the altar, but he would actually sprinkle it on everything. A little on the wall, a little over here, on the floor, on that stuff, even on himself. He would put it everywhere because he recognized that it was all contaminated. And then there was even instructions given in Leviticus that even if there was, you know, they said, hey, Moses, so if you got a house and if there's mildew in that house, you know, try to get rid of the mildew. If you can't, offer an animal sacrifice. You know, put some, put some blood over there. Because all of it, all the brokenness, all the pollution, all of the sickness, it's all a result of this singular moment. You see how it all focuses down to this. And it makes us realize that what might just seem like words on a page that it's a history was a tragic moment <coughs> that affects us all to this day. Well, that... Animal sacrifice was honestly just okay. It's honestly just okay. I mean, it got us by. I mean, there's moments where we can look in life, can't we, and we can say, you know what? I'm doing okay. I mean, yeah, things could be better, but I'm doing okay. You know, I'm doing okay in my marriage. Just ask my, don't ask my wife. Um, I'm doing okay in my, in, my, in my job. I'm doing okay with whatever's going on inside of my soul. At least I'm keeping it contained. Like, I'm sure most likely, probably, it's not affecting other people around me, although it probably is. I'm doing okay. Well, let's take a look at how just okay is not okay. Just okay? Guess who just got reinstated? Well, not officially. Nervous? Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. I'll see you in there. Just okay is not okay. <laughs> Just okay? <laughs> Just okay is not okay. I mean, if that doctor came into that room, I'd be looking at my wife, wheel me out of here. We got to escape. I'm not going into that surgery. Just okay is not okay in a whole lot of different ways of life. And there's a whole lot of fun commercials that go along with that. But we know this to be true. Just okay is not okay. And, that's, and that is true of God as well. He didn't intend for the animal sacrifice to be the end all. He knew that we needed an ultimate fixer. Someone that would come and pay the ultimate price. Someone that would come and fix us completely. That could do the impossible. But what is a fixer? I've been using this term. What is... A fixer. A fixer is an outside agent who has the power to solve problems and get things done. The interesting thing about a fixer is you only need one when you, it is impossible or you cannot do it yourself. Yes. You only need a fixer 
When you cannot accomplish the task yourself, you need someone else to help you do it. And Corinthians shows us a lot about the kind of fixer we need. It says in 1 Corinthians 19, For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. We needed an outside agent. The animal sacrifice wasn't going to cut it. Just okay was not okay. So what did God do? He said, I'm going to send my son to live a life, to die a death, to rise from the dead, to accomplish what only he could accomplish in atoning for our sin, in reconciling us to God. Because it wasn't, God isn't just interested in fixing the house. He's not just in fix, interested in getting rid of the contagion. What was also broken in that moment? Relationship. Relationship. Relationship which is really what's dearest to God. And here, God says, I, through Jesus, we can be reconciled. That word reconcile in here in Corinthians is the strongest form of reconcile in the Greek. It means to be changed from one status to another completely. Here, it says that we were alienated and enemies of God. There might be a few people that would recognize, you know what, I was an enemy of God. You know, Apostle Paul, I think he acknowledged I was an enemy of God. I doubt many of us, even on our most truthful day, would say before Jesus, I was an enemy of God. And yet here it says we were. That there had to be peace made. That we were enemies of God of our own doing. And that through what Jesus did, he could fix the problem. We could go from the status of enemy to the status of son and daughter. Man, does that change things. We needed Jesus, the ultimate fixer. As I was thinking about this idea of a fixer, I was thinking, how does this relate to our modern day? And I realized that I need to give my friend Chad a call because Chad is a modern day fixer. So I gave him a call. I see Chad, he works for a restoration reconstruction provider for properties damaged by water, fire, flood, and pretty much any other disaster you could think of. They do it. They do it all. And so when disaster happens, he's called in to help. So I called Chad. I said, Chad, so you get there, you get to the scene, sometimes in the moment of the tragedy, literally while the fire is still going or while there's still like water flooding every which way or whatever the disaster might be. What do you do? And what he said next gives us as Christians and us as, as those that are wondering what are our next steps, a whole lot of insight. First, he said, I respond to the emergency and stabilize the situation. Christian, this is what God did for you. He came in. He responds to the situation. We have a moment where we recognize, God, I am a sinner. I need need to repent. My building of my life is falling every which way, and honestly, I'm the one breaking it. I'm Wreck-It Ralph. I'm the one breaking it. I was falling every which way, and God... Jesus comes in and says, you know what? Let's just stabilize this mess. Let's let's do what we can to stabilize it. And also respond. Have a face-to-face moment with us. Right? Then, removal and monitoring is the next step. He said, I have to, to look at everything that needs to be cleaned out of this space 
and then start moving it out. Anybody here ever heard of Victory Weekend? It is what we do in this church when we look at the areas of our lives, and again, this is for the Christian, that are broken and beat up, fire burned, contaminated, and we say, you know what? God's saying, I want to build something there. I want to put a room right there. And he said, we got to clear this out first. We got to clear out this debris. That's what we do at Victory Weekend, and that's what we're constantly in the process of. And Jesus is monitoring this as daily sanctifies us through his word. This is what is happening in our lives. Then, and this is not exact, but at least with Chad, this is how they go about it. They propose repairs. And honestly, what's so interesting is this is the first time a definite cost is given. I mean, honestly, when we, when we accept Christ on the front end and God's stabilizing things, we're just thankful to be alive sometimes. We don't even, we, we kind of are like, okay, I kind of see a little bit of a fraction of the cost. But there's no, we can't really see the bigger picture of it. Here, proposing repairs, all of a sudden, Jesus comes up to us, so taking the analogy and says, hey, so for everything that's already been done and everything that's yet to be done, this is what it costs me. This is what it cost me. But what's so interesting is that while God has already paid it, the next step that we have to decide is how are we going to proceed? Are we going to allow God to build what he desires to build in us? Are we going to hold it up? Whatever stage you're in, are we going to allow life to just be okay? Are we going to desire and expect more and recognize that while we can't bring that about, we have a fixer who can? We can't do any of it. Only he can. And he desires to, but we can hold up the process. Don't let that be us. He's already paid it. For us, and honestly, he's there to the end. If we're willing to let him, he'll stick through till the job's done. Stay there till the job's done. Every time. So how will we proceed? If you don't know God today, don't have a relationship with him, he's done this for us. You see the problem How are you going to proceed with what he's extending to you today in a relationship with you? For the Christian here in this room, how will you proceed when Jesus says, this area is just not okay? Okay is not good enough. we got to do more. And I desire to do more in you. Getting back to what we said at the beginning, all Christians continually need God to fix their life. We constantly break things that God is fixing, and yet we are reconciled, able to look to Jesus, our fixer, each and every day. We don't want to be Wreck-It Ralph anymore. This was the sign we had up for all your kids and kids' praise. (laughs) Don't wreck it, Ralph. We don't want to be this anymore. It's only hurting us. And honestly, the longer that we hold up what Jesus wants to do, that's costing us something too. Let's not hold it up. And as we close here this morning, at any given time in our Christian life, there's at least one thing that's just okay, that we need a divine supernatural fixer. And I want to ask you this morning, what is that one thing for you and I? What is that one thing where you say, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your son. Jesus, thank you for being that advocate 
for fulfilling the role that only you could fulfill for my life. For bringing about the fix and continuing to bring that fix in my life that I need. But Lord, there's an area that's just okay. What is that for us today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that for all of us, for every person here, that okay would not be good enough. Just okay would not be good enough. Lord, let us take what you've done. Let us receive it. Let us allow you day by day to do the work to fix, to heal, to remove, to stabilize, to restore, to repair, and to build. Lord, let us not inhibit you in any way. We love you, Lord. Praise God. Appreciate that, Jonathan. Can you give him a hand? Not bad. Thank you, buddy. You can stay up here. Stay up here. This month, as we're celebrating Easter, we're taking communion. Uh, we did it last Sunday. We're doing it today. And we're going to do it on Easter Sunday as well. And I wanted to wait till the end of the message to take communion. And I, I wanted to... I just want to take a moment to explain why. As we take communion, that bread represents Jesus' body that was broken. When Jesus had the Last Supper with his disciples, he took the bread, he thanked God for it, and he broke it. The symbolism in there is overwhelming. Then he took the cup, and he blessed it, and he shared it with his disciples. Jesus said, do this as long as you gather together and remember me. The significance in light of what we've just heard is overwhelming. It's not just symbolic. What we are learning and what I want to share with you and why I wanted to wait until the end for communion is the fact that we need Jesus' blood and body every single day. The gospel is not just the ABCs of Christianity. The gospel is the A to Z of Christianity. What Jesus did on the cross still has effective power for you and me today. We need someone to come in and to fix every area of our lives because okay is not okay. Just okay is not okay. And as Jonathan and Amy and I were working on this message together and as we were talking about it among our staff we do this on Wednesday we and this is for this all of us here in this room today please hear me you've accepted certain areas of your life as just being that's okay I know it's not the way it needs to be I know it's not in optimal working order but at least it's not totally broken totally unhinged totally off the hinges so I'm just going to let it go and we do that, parents, we do this with our kids. We do this in our relationships with our friends. We do this in our marriage. And we say, just okay, that's good enough. But Jesus says, no, no, I want to come into that area and I want to fix it in a way where it's not just good, or it's not just okay, it's best. You guys, okay is the enemy of best. Good is the enemy of best. Well, that's pretty good. Christian, and I just want to speak to the men here. I did this in the first service, so ladies, you can tune out or you can listen carefully because you might want to quote me on this later, ladies. If you're married here today, men, I know that you have a desire and you try hard to fix things on your own, but there are a lot of things in your marriage you can't fix on your own. You need to invite Jesus as the fixer in your marriage. And you know, you know how little kids, when they break something, they feel bad about it. They try, they start to try to fix it on their own. What ends up happening when kids do it? They make it worse. They break it more. They get it all messed up even more. And when, I think with Wreck It Ralph, I didn't see the whole movie, but every time he tried to fix something, it just got worse and worse. Men, I know, I know, I can sound pedantic like a father talking to a child, but I'm speaking to myself as well. 
the more we try to fix things on our own, the more we break it relationally. So dads, husbands, I need you as we take communion today. I'm asking you to come up with your spouse and I'm asking you to do, Amy and I did this today in our first service, invite Jesus into your marriage to fix the marriage the way God wants it to be. Because just okay is not okay. And good is the enemy of what's best. If you're single in here today, you know, a lot of times when you're single and you're in your teens, you kind of think all your relationships are cool and you think you're really smart and you think you know better, but you don't know anything relationally when you're teens. If you're a teen in here, God bless you, I love you, but you're really, you're just uneducated because you don't have the life experience. But you get into your 20s and you start noticing that the way you act and react to people, it starts pushing people away. And you start noticing that the people you thought were your friends were, they're not quite the same level of friendship that they used to be. What's happened? You've wrecked it, Ralph. You're not even aware of it, just like Ralph wasn't aware. You're breaking things relationally with other people by the things that you say, by what you post on, on social media, or what you don't do, how you don't respond, not just what you do, but also how what you for, don't do in your friendships. You're wrecking it. But there is help. If you'll invite Jesus as the divine fixer into your life, he can make things better. Man, I'm telling you, An apology goes a long way, but the blood of Jesus goes a lot longer in restoring relationships and reconciling people. And and here's the last thing and the greatest thing. I'm going to end. I'm building up to to an apex here. All of us every day are doing things that wreck, that are ruining, that are tainting our relationship with God. And we're not even aware of it. But there is a fixer whose blood is constantly being poured out. Jesus is constantly making intercession for us. Why? So that we can have unbroken relationship with God the Father through the blood of the cross. That's why I wanted to wait to the end to take communion. It's not just, this is not just for the non-believers. This is for Christians every day. The more that we go in Christ, the farther we go down this road, the more we need his body and his blood every day. If you're not a Christian here today, today would be a great day on Palm Sunday 2019 to give your life to Christ. You can pray a very simple prayer that I prayed years ago. Jesus, come into my life. I want you. I turn from a life of sin and I turn towards you. Be my Lord and Savior. Be my divine fixer. Come into my life and change me and transform me from the inside out. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. Be my Lord. Be my God.